It's Memorial Day 2016. I remember being on a table, and the doctors are coming in one at a time. And as soon as I saw the look on their face, I knew it was in trouble. The doctor came up to me and says, Mr. McMahon, it's not your heart. It's your liver. Your liver and your pancreas are shutting down. If we don't go to some extreme measures tonight, you're going to die. It came as a surprise to me because that day started out like any other day. I went from being a CEO with a seven-figure income to being labeled an alcoholic and put on the end of a liver transplant waiting list. So I literally needed someone else to die for me to live. And I'm here today to share with you how I went from broken to beautiful and to teach you an algorithm to recreate yourself. What is an algorithm and why should you care? An algorithm is nothing other than a set of steps to solve a problem or accomplish a task. It's that simple. You see them all the time. Google and Facebook have algorithms for their apps to make life easier, but you would just as easily use an algorithm to make a grilled cheese sandwich or to bake a cake. They're a big part of my life. They're a big part of all of our, all of our lives. I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory. I grew up in a little town called Pittsfield, Mass. Pittsfield is known for baseball. My father was an excellent baseball player. Here he is in 1949. He signed a pro contract with the Cincinnati Reds for $6,000. He's here with my grandparents. That was a big deal at the time because $6,000 was the most amount of money they could pay anybody at the time. If you ever met my father, he'd tell you that a week later, Yankee Hall of Famer Mickey Mantle actually signed for only $1,150, meaning my father was a better baseball player than Mickey Mantle. <laughs> One day. <laughs> he had six kids. Dad taught us algorithms for baseball. He taught us how to hit, how to throw, how to catch, how to win. They worked. My brother Sean and my brother Eddie both played professionally. They worked for me, too. I got a scholarship, went to college. I remember showing up to college my first day. My parents dropped me off, and I'm in the middle of my dorm room by myself. I'm starting to think, am I good enough to be here? Do I even belong? And right then, this sensation came upon me like I'd never felt before. Uh, my heart started thumping. I started sweating. I had the chills. I felt like I was being dropped out of an airplane. I had, I've been in the middle of first of what it would be many panic attacks. And instead of going to bed and getting a good night's sleep for my first day, playing baseball, meeting my new team, my new college, I went to a bar and I drank alcohol until the symptoms went away. And that would be an algorithm that I would repeat as needed regularly for the next 30 years. I had to drop out of college, no job, no money, baby on the way, no degree. The only job I could get was selling life insurance door to door. I went from a hero on the baseball diamond to being the butt of a joke right out of a Woody Allen movie. Selling life insurance door to door is a dying art, and I hope it stays dead because it's pride swallowing and miserable. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> terrible. I was on the brink of financial and emotional breakdown when two amazing things happened on January 10th, 1992. The first one was my son David was born, which was amazing. And as soon as he was born, the doctors came in, they put ink on his feet and his fingers, and they put it on this card. They're making his birth certificate. And then the nurse told me that they take these certificates down to town hall every, every day with all the new babies, and they register them. They register the birth. It was in important information because as an insurance agent, we actually used to wait around until Tuesday night. We had to wait till the birth announcements came out in the newspaper, and we would call you to try to sell you life insurance if you had a baby. We'd interrupt your dinner, and you'd hang up on us. <laughs> Horribly miserable. Roll the clocks up 25 years. I used that algorithm as a framework, that one epiphany, that I could get that information earlier. I would go to town hall. I built an algorithm around getting that information earlier, calling them first, and it worked. Believe it or not, that one idea was a framework that I used to make a six and later seven-figure income. And if you roll the clocks up 25 years, I'm a CEO of a multi-million dollar company. I have hundreds of employees, tens of thousands of clients. We're managing over a billion dollars. From the outside looking in, I had it all. Private driver, flew all over the world. My passport was full. But inside, I, was, I blew up. I blew up financially, but I also blew up physically. I was 350 pounds, which meant I was morbidly obese. 
And I was still medicating these panic attacks daily with alcohol, and it wasn't working. For all the ways I used algorithms to make money and be successful, I could never find one just to feel better and be happy. Which brought us back to that day, I didn't feel well, and I got dropped off at the hospital. I got dropped off Memorial Day 2016, I didn't die. But the doctor told me a few things. The first thing he told me was that I'm gonna need a liver transplant to survive and that my life expectancy was probably about six months. He also told me that for every four people that, that need a liver transplant, there's only one available donor. And they have this interesting calculator that I found online to find out how long it would take me to get a liver transplant. And the calculator told me that my average wait time could be expected to be 321 days. So I didn't have enough time. And I spend two months, three months, trying to get into a transplant center, which is very difficult. And I get into a transplant center finally, and the hospital tells me I have 90 days left. I'm sick. I'm starting to be jaundiced. I'm 60 days into my 90-day death sentence. And I get this letter. And this letter was from the hospital, and they had basically told me I had to leave the program. They had accused me of violating their sobriety requirement, which means they thought I was drinking, and I hadn't been. I hadn't had a drink since that day. That also meant that I'd be unlikely to get a transplant anywhere else, and I most likely would die. I had to act quick, and the only thing I could think of is I hired a company that administered a lie detector test, and I passed. I quickly, running out of time, took those results to Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. I said, Mr. McMahon, we believe you, but we have a requirement. We have a requirement that you need to go to drug and alcohol rehab program in order to get a transplant here. Textbook definition, by the way, of rehabilitation is to restore something to his prior condition. I'm kind of thinking, like, that's kind of what got me in this trouble. <laughs> but I'll do it. So, so the bad news is it looks like I'm going to spend most of the rest of my life in a drug and alcohol rehab center. But the good news is, there's always good news, the good news is I'm finally going to meet some of these famous celebrities that I hear so much about in rehab. <laughs> Britney Spears and Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Sheen. I get to rehab. They're not there. Okay. It was $1,800 a day. For $1,800 a day, they told me that I was an addict, that I had a disease and that there was no known cure. And their algorithm, their treatment for this was for me to go to meetings for the rest of my life and call myself an addict. I'm thinking, well, that doesn't sound like I had a lot of fun. Good thing I'm going to be dead in 30 days because if I live, I definitely don't want to live like that. And I once heard on a TED stage, Johan Harry said that, he said this, he said, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection, to be connected. And I was like, wow, I really like that idea. And I was thinking, like, the opposite of rehabilitation is recreation. Not to be restored back to what I was, but to make something new, something that never existed before. That's what recreation means, to recreate. I get my degree, I get out of rehab, I bring it to Mayo Clinic, and they tell me I'm too sick to be operated on. I'm inoperable. I'm going to die. I can't even get listed. I was a financial planner, so what you do when you're a financial planner is you get your financial plan together, and you put it on the table, and you put your life's work in what's called a family meeting. You push everything in your life across the table, and it's gone. There's nothing left. Everybody left. It's me and my brother there. I said, geez, Tim, I think my whole entire life's been a mistake. And to make matters worse, I knew the morning was soon coming that my son, Joseph, and David would wake up, and I would not. And there was just no good reason. The only thing that was left was a memory of a guy that drank himself to death. I wasn't afraid of dying anymore. I just didn't want to die like that. I'm in the end. I'm starting to smell like death. My mom's a nurse, and she's with me. And uh, praying for a miracle. I spend my last days with the woman I spent my first days with. And the phone rings, and it's Mayo Clinic. A 28-year-old prisoner died in Alabama, and they said he was a match. But they said he was an IV drug user, which meant that he was high risk, which meant that they weren't sure the liver was safe for me to take. And they put, it, they put it up to me, and I took it. 
and it worked. They go to Alabama, they lift it in planes and helicopters to Jacksonville, and they put it in my body, and here we are together. And I'm alive. I'm alive, and I'm there the next day. I said, wow, I have a second chance. I can recreate myself. And I wanted to make a better use, a more meaningful use of my second chance. I later found out, by the way, that up to four dozen people passed on that high-risk liver because of the, the high-risk nature. It's a miracle I'm alive. And if you step back from my life, it looked like someone took a piece of pottery from six feet above the ground and dropped it on a marble floor. There were pieces of me everywhere, my business, my relationships, my dignity, everything. But what it felt like, what it really felt like is that someone went through with a Zamboni and just wiped my life away. Clean. I had a clean slate. What would you do if you can make yourself into anything you wanted to be? To recreate yourself, and, and you have no worry about people judging you, because one of the very few advantages to being that broken and that busted up is there's nowhere else to go but up. And I got busy. I got busy. I lost weight. I built algorithms to lose weight. I lost 140 pounds. I had a message that I wanted to share with the world. I learned a lot. I wanted to talk about it. So I published a book. And I spoke on stages all over the world about this three-step process that anyone can do at any time to recover from anything and recreate themselves. Step number one is the most important word in the world, in my opinion, is decisions. And it's a misunderstood word because decisions aren't about adding things to your life. Decisions are about cutting away. If you break that word down, the etymology of decision, the means away from, like a detour. Scission means to cut, to cut away from, like incision. To change the fruit, Stephen Covey says you need to change the root. You need to cut away from the roots, and the roots are heavily, heavily embedded in your persona, which is the Latin word for mask. It's what characters wear. They wear a mask. It's who you are. It's the story you tell yourself. They wanted me to be an addict with a disease that had no cure. I wanted to be a superhero. I had a purpose. It made a difference. There's places and people I couldn't go around anymore. I had to cut them. There's things I loved I got rid of. I stopped binging on booze. I started binging on books. And step number two, this is important, you need to tell yourself a better story because if you do not have a story that you tell yourself, a narrative, the world will give one to you and it'll ask you to wear it like a suit, okay? And if you don't know how to build this story, there's an exercise I want to walk you through right now. Let's pretend we're all going right now to a loved one's funeral. And we get up to the casket and we look down and it's not a loved one, it's you. It's your funeral, three years from now. And you find out there's five speakers that are gonna talk about the person you were three years from now. Your spouse, your children, an a friend, your best friend, someone from work and someone from your church or your charity. They're gonna tell you how you lived. They're gonna tell everybody how you loved. They're gonna tell everyone how you made a difference, how you touched the world. That's the superhero that you want to pull yourself into. That's the story, this giant domino, and I'm going to teach you why these are important, that you want to become. Because step number three, step number three is you need to build a strategic plan. People don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. I learned that as a financial advisor. So I'm going to use the metaphor of the domino. Does everybody know that a two-inch domino can actually knock over another two-inch domino, can basically do that forever? It's called the domino effect. <laughs> do you know a two-inch domino can actually knock over a three-inch domino? The domino has what's called action potential. If you're this broke and you're this down and you want to be this superhero, this domino cannot knock over that. It just can't happen. It doesn't work. But what it can do, what a little two-inch domino can do, it can knock over a three-inch domino, okay? And a three-inch domino can knock over a four-and-a-half-inch domino, and a four-and-a-half-inch domino can knock over a seven-and-a-half, and here my math fails me. It keeps going and going and going. <clears throat> I could barely walk when I got my transplant, but I could drink more water. I couldn't run a marathon, but I could eat a little less. 
I couldn't do a lot of things, but I could move more. I could take yoga. I could start riding my bike. I could start hanging out with people, have interesting conversations. And guess what? Before you knew it, I built a plan and I have momentum going. The Romans say, in a tium demedium facti. Once you get started, you're halfway done. And then it never stops. This is the domino effect. And this is how you recreate yourself a little bit at a time. The little hinge swings a big door. A little bit at a time, create that momentum and create that superhero that you can be one at a time. Do what you can do today, what's in front of you. Do not focus on the big domino. You'll get there, just make progress, utilize your action potential. I'm gonna leave you with this. Western culture puts so much emphasis on perfection. Let me tell you, there is nothing that's perfect in this world. The world breaks everyone, and it will break you one day. The fractures and the bumps and the scars that you have on your body are the stars of your life. It's an opportunity to put it back together and recreate yourself. The Japanese have a mending process called kintsugi. It's where they take this broken pottery and they put it back together. And they put it back together with this golden lacquer. And the golden lacquer is the glue that holds back together. They don't restore the pottery back to its original condition. They recreate it. Sometimes repair requires recreation. In Kintsugi, the repaired art is more valuable than the original unbroken art. Thank you. <laughs>